Australia goes green and success follows. Michael Clark delves into the Marnus Labuschagne form slump. Is there some player unrest in the Kiwi camp? Ross Taylor joins us. And the latest blow for Will Pekoski, Ferguson and Finch discuss. Let's go around the wicket. And welcome to a brand new edition of Around the Wicket. I'm Narrowly Meadows. Helen Ferguson and Aaron Finch alongside me. The Aussies getting it done. 172 run victory within four days in the first test of a two test series in New Zealand. And I've got to say, the team performance, and we'll delve into this properly as the show goes on. But the fact is, you've got guys who aren't necessarily standing up in their own craft, like a Smith, like a Manus, but they then contribute in the field. Or even a Hazelwood with the wickets, he didn't take a lot of them, but then he has that partnership with Green. Is that what you love to see as a, as a captain? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's a strength of a really good quality cricket side, is that guys just aren't worrying about their own business. They're also contributing in the field. Manus Labuschagne, that run out of, of Kane Williamson, which turn the game, I think, in well and truly in Australia's favour. So just a really good quality performance across the board. There were two standout performers, though. Nathan Lyon with the 10 wickets, mm -hmm. Cameron Green with the 174 not out. Who's the player of the match in your mind, Ferg? Oh, this is a really tough one. I, I think I just gave it to Nathan Lyon, top scoring in the second innings with the bat for the Aussies. That was a really important contribution. Put even more pressure onto the New Zealanders trying to chase a huge total. It was just Nathan for mine. Cameron Green for me, I think the, the right decision. 174 not out on a wicket that was that was very green. It went all over the place in the first couple of sessions of the game and then slowed down and spun as the game went mm -hmm. on. So I think that batting was harder in, in those conditions than, than what bowling was. Good problem to have well, when you've very, got multiple options for player right, of the exactly. match. That's right, um, exactly. Elise Perry in the WPL in mm. India is smashing it in more ways than one. Overnight, <laughs> she has destroyed the back window of a sponsor's car, which is within the ground, and her reaction is absolutely priceless. We love to see Elise Perry doing so well, but this WPL in its second iteration, how important is it to the women's game, do you think? Oh, it's huge. The competition is, is unbelievable. And for Elise Perry to say that it's the best atmosphere that she's ever played in front of is, yeah. is extraordinary. Just on the six, I can't believe that that doesn't happen more often. With the amount of <laughs> yeah. cars that are parked around WPL, IPL games, a lot of sixes get hit. But I haven't seen that too often. That's incredible. And that power as well from Elise Perry, just pummeling it through that. that Well, it'd be pretty strong glass, that. That's a fantastic shot. But she's really broadened her horizons when, when you speak about her game and where she's taking her strike rates to. It's fantastic to see. Second season of the WPL, I reckon punch in more ways than one. They'll be pretty <laughs> yeah. happy as a car sponsorship, no doubt about it. On to a more serious topic. Will Pekoski has retired her once more. Another blow to the head. This is now the 11th, 12th time that it's happened. What was your reaction? It looked like a really sickening blow when it first hit him. It was one of those ones where you see the batter turn their head and it looks like that it could get them sort of underneath the, mm. the grill or the stem guards. And... Uh, from all reports that he had mild concussion symptoms and, and he was better than expected after seeing the hit and seeing how long he was down for. But I just hope his health is okay. That's the most important thing. There's, there's one thing for guys or, or people wanting to see him get back and playing shield cricket or playing test cricket for Australia, but his overall health has to be the main priority here. So what is the next step, Ferg? Because there's a lot of people, you know, wondering whether does somebody need to step in here and stop him from playing the game. I also think about the role of the bowlers in all of this and the position that it puts them in. What do you think? Yeah, it's an interesting one. We, we've seen in the AFL, uh, you know, Angus Brayshaw recently retire after a lot of concussions in, in his career. And, and I hope it's not the same for Will. It, it, I felt sick in the stomach as well when I saw it. I feel like you know, it's just... It's so much of it needs to come back to where the experts lie with this one. How do they feel about it? Because there will be bowlers, there'll be selectors, you know, wondering whether seeing him in the cauldron again over a long period of time is the best thing for him right now. I'm hopeful that the experts come back to us and say he's going to be fine. They're mild symptoms. He'll be right in a, you know, a month or two's time. But it, it may get to the point where he needs an extended period, maybe a year or two, just to let things settle and, and reassess. I hadn't thought about the bowler side of it until you mentioned it then, of, of the impact that it can have on a bowler. I mean, we always think about the batsman and, and mm. like I said, we hope that Will recovers and, and everything is okay. But 
every time a bowler is running into somebody who's been hit so many times and, and you see the impact that that has. Mm. So it's a really difficult question, I think. And, and maybe if somebody who's been in that position before would, would say that it makes them a little bit uncomfortable yeah. as well because you, you use the bouncer as, a, as an effective tool in the game. It's not something that you can take out of it. So uh, it's, it's a really interesting question and one that I think probably needs a bit more investigation. Yeah. As you both said, our first and foremost mm. thoughts are Will with Will Pukowski That's and right. his family as well. So fingers crossed, he's a great bloke. We love you, Will, and yes. we hope that you're back up and firing and health comes first. Don't go anywhere on Around the Wicket because Michael Clark is going to join us after this short break. And as we go to the break, let's celebrate the GOAT. Oh, it's Captain's dream, really. Um, it's just yeah, it's just a real sense of calm out there when you know you've got someone that good on a wicket that's giving him a little bit of help. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's fun, really. You can get creative um, with some of the field placements, knowing he's going to land it exactly where you want it to. I would absolutely love if he's playing until 2027. Um, and I don't think there's yeah, much that's going to get in his way. So, yeah, I already told him the day he retires, I'm definitely giving up the captaincy because <laughs> it makes my life a hell of a lot easier. I mean, he was obviously fantastic. I think, you know, he obviously scored a big innings, but I, I thought the way he went about it was as impressive as I've seen. I reckon that's as sharp as I've seen him put pressure back on the opposition. He was using his feet to um, you know, upset the bowler's length on a really tough day one wicket. Um, I, I thought it was incredibly um, impressive and it's given him a good blueprint of, of how to play going forward as well. I think, you know, credit to the selectors and those guys as well for not only, um, I guess, backing him, but prioritising test cricket. Last week they said go back to shield cricket and um, you know, stay in this format. Uh, for a little while, obviously he scored 100 there and, and set him up for success here. So, Cameron Green with a player of the match performance, 174 not out in that new position batting at four. Michael Clark joins us now. Pup, was this a career-defining and even a team-defining knock given it proves that Green and Mitch Marsh can play in the same 11? I think it was a brilliant innings. How are you guys? Um, yeah, Cameron Green's innings, outstanding. I think the discipline he showed early, coming in on a pretty tough batting wicket uh, and batting at number four against that new ball. Um, I think he'll be praising his openers. I think Smitty and, and Kawaja did a great job to only be one down at lunch. Um, that always helps when you're batting at number four as well, that opening partnership or your top three finding a way to get through uh, you know, those tough overs at the start. But then the way also he played with the tail uh, showed maturity and class. You know, I think everybody's already known. Cameron Green's very talented. Uh, now he's putting that talent into performance. Bat, ball, field, unbelievable athlete. Um, you know, his, his bowling's is good enough to be a third quick. And now he's showing his bat enough. His batting's certainly good enough to, to bat in the top four. Um, I, it's not career defining. I, I don't. I think he he's, hasn't been around long enough to um, to have that conversation. You, you look at Marnus Labuschagne. We're, we're having conversations around. You know, should he still be in the team? Well, he's he's been the best batter in the world, best Test batter in the world for over twelve months, and now we're having those conversations about Marnus. So, uh, you know, his second hundred, his first hundred batting at number four. Uh, very talented young player, and I think he's got a bright, bright future for Australia. There's no doubt about it. And hopefully there's plenty more hundreds where that came from. I think what's the most impressive thing is the tactical approach that he had. I think what we've seen in some previous innings of him is he gets so defensive in his first 20 or 30 balls and, and just doesn't put any kind of pressure back on the opposition. But like Pat Cummins said, the way that he used his feet down the wicket, even against the quicks to disturbed their length when hitting the top of the stumps was going to be incredibly difficult on that wicket. I think that that just showed a guy who's starting to be become more comfortable at test level and say, you know what, this is the game plan that I'm going with. And to have the courage to stick to that when the ball's going around corners, easier said than done. We'll get on to Manus Labuschagne shortly, Pup. But Steve Smith, he, in this World Test Championship cycle, has had just 100, and that was during the Ashes, He's reached 30 11 times in 11 matches, and this past test was Amazing. one of those. He did the job, as you say, as an opener of getting through that new ball. But what does that tell you about Steve Smith, that he's reaching 30 and not going on with it? Uh, it tells me that he would be frustrated if you read those stats to him. Knowing Smitty, he probably doesn't know them. Um, that's the hardest part as a, as a test batsman, getting to 30. So... 
he'll be extremely frustrated that he's getting there, doing the hard work and not going on. But, again, this can happen throughout your career as well. You know, you look at his... Um, his record, it's phenomenal. Uh, 50s versus 100s, very good. So it, it's not like it's happened his entire career. I just think it's one of those stages that you go through. Um, you know, on one hand, you're happy you're getting to 30. You'd rather be averaging 30 than averaging five. Uh, on the other hand, when you are doing the hard work and getting through that really tough period, you'd like to go on and, and make a couple of hundred. So, again, I, I see... You know, Smitty is is one of those players. It's not going to be from lack of work or lack of process or uh, looking at statistics and numbers and finding out how he's getting out. He would be doing all of that to try and improve because his record's phenomenal. He's a brilliant player and he wants to keep making hundreds. And he's good enough to do that anywhere he bats at the moment. He's going to open the batting. That's his spot. And I have no doubt he'll find a way. Does it become then not a technical thing but actually a mental thing if he's getting those starts, Ferg? Yeah, I think like uh, Mick said there, like it becomes a, a frustration. So there he's got to make sure that he's not focused mm. on where he's at in his innings but just what's coming up in front of him. He's playing the game in front of him. And, and I think that where Smithy was six to seven months ago um, – compared to over the last month. He's got his rhythm back. He just hasn't quite been able to break the back of it and go on and get those big hundreds we're used to. But you know, looking at those numbers, he's not getting knocked over early, like Pup said as well. He's actually found rhythm in the last month. I think he's going to hurt someone pretty badly over the next couple of months. If you look at some teams mm. around the world, they would take anybody averaging 37 in their side. And we're talking <laughs> yeah. about it like it's an absolute disaster that yeah. Steve Smith is averaging 37 <laughs> yeah. in this World Test Championship. It's ridiculous, really. Which, by the way, he probably would have had 100 against the West Indies if everyone else didn't yeah. fall around him as well. I think uh, let next summer look out. He's going he's gonna to put someone to the sword. Moving on to Marnus Labashane. His last six knocks, 22 runs and an average of 4.4. What's your advice, Pup? Uh, make 100 so all of us can get off his back. Um, <laughs> Oh, look, it's it's frustrating as a player, but again, it, it's part of the game. I, I think the only thing I can think about when I was going through some tough times was I, I think your mindset can change to trying not to get out versus looking to score runs. And that's a tough place to be because then it feels like, oh, you get a good ball or you get that decision that doesn't go your way or... You know, someone dives and takes an absolute specky catch, but it happens to be you that's out, you know, and your mates are getting dropped or they're hitting in the gap. So, you know, I think he just needs to keep that positive intent. And that doesn't mean hitting boundaries at the start of his innings if, if the ball's not there to hit, but I think it's the vision that you are looking to score. You were just making a decision based on that one ball at a time. If the ball is full enough to drive, drive it. If it's short enough to cut, cut it. If you get out playing that stroke looking to score, then, you know, that doesn't mean you go into your shell. So I understand what Marnus is going through. Uh, only runs can get you out of it. You know, we're all going to sit here and talk about it until he makes a big score, but it's actually not that far away. But it's easy for me to see that, say that sitting from a distance and, and because I've been in that situation. But I think if he keeps his intent, whether that's defending, running between the wickets, getting off strike, hitting that bad ball for four... I think you'll find he's too good a player to keep going this, this amount of time without making a big score. What I found in my career, and, and totally different one day in T20 cricket versus um, test cricket, but I'd always think, like Pup said, oh, I need 100 or I need 50, 60, 70 to get everybody off my back. But reality is, when I started thinking about that, I forgot about the process. Mm. So for me, then it was about... Right, yeah. I want this score, but how do I go about it? And before you know it, you've played four or five games and yeah. you still haven't scored runs because you're so focused on the outcome and not the process. So I found that the most difficult thing to then work back from and get my head around is, right, what's worked for me in the past? Is my training the same? Has something changed in my preparation? Is is my mental clarity being clouded somewhere? So, I mean, that, that was that was some simple things that, that I did. Sorry, it was a difficult thing because it, you just want the runs, mm. but but you forget the process to mm. get there. Manus is a very positive person. He's very upbeat. Would this start to impact his life? Did it for you, Finchie, when you were going through those slumps? Does it start to creep its way into all aspects of your life? No, I don't think so. If you've got a really good separation between what you're doing on the field and off the field, I, I felt as though as a captain, I probably captained 
better on the field and off the field when I wasn't playing well. Because I think sometimes you you take it for granted when you are playing well and you're getting run to, that everything's easy and it's all roses and butterflies. But when you're not going well, you actually, I think you're at your best because it's not just about do as I say. It's about, right, how, is this, how does this look for everybody else? What is my training like? What does our training as a team look like? Because then you can start to nut down what... I guess is a really good process for the rest of the side as well. Ferg, you've noticed as well his mannerisms. I mean, he does seem a little more timid out there, doesn't he? Yeah, he does. When he first came into test cricket and when we were playing shield cricket against him, the energy levels and the arousal levels that you saw from him were through the roof. And it was a little bit Mike Hussey-esque. High energy, loud calls, looking to get in and out quickly for two. And, and Marnus's levels are down a little bit. That's what I'd like to see a bit more from him. Get the... Get that energy back into your innings and, and like Mick said, look to put pressure back onto the bowlers and I think that's his best way forward. Pup, is it tough getting that balance right between personal life, professional life when you're going through something like this? How did you find it? Uh, I think it can affect you, yeah, because you, you, you're playing your sport 24-7. If you're not playing your training, you're thinking about it all the time. When you're not making runs, you you doubt everything. When you're batting beautifully or the team is winning, you, you know, life seems a lot easier with every single part of it. But there needs to be a separation. There's no doubt about it. When you walk onto the field, it's, it's work time. It's game time. But I think the other thing as well, and... Um, it's fair. It's it's you know it's why we sit here with with a job. We look closer at people and players and individuals when they're not performing as well as we're accustomed to, because we need to find a reason. So we're looking at Marnus so closely now with every single thing he does to work out. Oh, is that why he's not making runs, or is that the change? So I, I just think. Marnus needs to make sure he continues to to back himself. The self belief through this time is really important, and unfortunately, that's that's the way of sport now and and social media at the highest level. You know, the rest of us are going to have an opinion and judge and look for any any sort of reason to as to why he's not at his best. But you know, it wouldn't hurt him to stay off social media or put his phone down or don't read the papers and. Just get back to, as the boys said in there, get back to doing what he's always done. And as Ferg said, he's played against him. If it's the running between the wickets, if it's the, the high intensity, that energy, um, you know, if that's what Marnus does when he's at his best, then, you know, get back to those consistent behaviours. For now, the coach and the captain have said absolutely not as far as his spot coming under pressure. But it's one to watch for this second test, and we'll talk more about it in a couple of days' time. Pup, thank you very much for your time on Around the Wicket. Don't Thanks, go guys. Anywhere, though, because after this short break, there's a few whispers in amongst the New Zealand camp, and Ross Taylor is going to tell us more. All oh, is not well. Ah. Uh. I think we probably could have uh, tried to get Green out uh, in that, on that second morning rather than sort of, I think the way he played that, that night before, we thought he was probably going to come out and play play some shots. But um, but yeah, we probably could look to get him out um, in the, on that second morning and uh, make things slightly easier than what uh, what we did. New Zealand captain Tim Southey admitting there that a few mistakes were made by the Kiwis along the way in the first test. We've got Ross Taylor <laughs> to join us now to talk more about it. Ross, thanks so much for joining us once more and around the wicket. What did you make of Tim Southey's captaincy? Yeah, I mean, uh, I think he, he started off very well, winning the toss on a, on a green seamer. <laughs> I wouldn't think it was... I have seen uh, wickets at the basin where you actually don't know where the the wicket is until you get out there and see the lines. Um, but no, I think he, he kept in well. He probably didn't bowl as well as he would have liked in that first session, but, um, you know, the Green and Marsh partnership probably swung the momentum back in Australia's favour and, and then probably the, you know, that Hazelwood and Green partnership the night before and, and then day two, uh, setting the field back, letting them get a, you know, an over a hundred run partnership just, Momentum shifted, and, and any time you send a team in in New Zealand, you need to bowl them out for 200, maybe 250, and they just uh, got ahead of the game too much. What did you think of that Saudi dismissal, Ross? In the second innings? Um, yeah, I think, uh, you know, when you're, when you're a batter, we all play poor shots. Um, but when you're captain, uh, 
you know, I think it just sends a bad message and the optics of it, I don't think, look, look very good. Um, you know, he he does get a lot of runs for us playing an attacking brand and, you know, he, he loves hitting sixes and, um, you know, him and Brendan have a bit of banter about, um, you know, whether he can ever catch them. But when you're captain, having to look your team in the eye and, you know, we didn't bat very well as a team. Um, you know, when, when you play a shot like that, it's hard uh, to... I guess, look the team in the eye and, and tell them off, so to speak. Sure, surely that's not genuine. He's 26 is away from Brendan McCullum. He's on 87 in Test Cricket, Brendan McCullum 107. Surely you're not looking at a stat like that, particularly when you're skipper. Oh, I wouldn't have thought so. I mean, the way that New Zealand play, they're always so disciplined, aren't they? And, and that, I think that's what they've been built around for such a long period of time. And that, that shot was a terrible shot. And like Ross <laughs> said, I mean, that, no one means to play a bad shot, but I think the, the intent was the worst part there. I think if you walk out to bat and you want to be attacking, that's one thing. But when you take it to the extreme like that, uh, that was poor. So he's got two wickets for the match, four wickets in his last three tests. Is he in New Zealand's best 11, Ross? Uh, obviously, being captain, uh, he probably is. Um, there's a test series, I think, in November in the subcontinent. I think, um, you know, six or seven months is a long time. Um but he, you know, he has very good record in New Zealand, um, and he'll want to re- rectify that. But I think, you know, the questions definitely need to be asked um, when we're probably only going to go in with two seamers uh, in the subcontinent. Whether you know he's in the two seamers uh, for that match. What do you think? Is he in the best eleven, Ferd? Look, I think at the moment he is. Um, obviously, with Neil Wagner retiring, which is you know, interesting timing um, from an outsider's uh, view in. But I think at the moment um, there's been an injury to O'Rourke as well. So it leaves them a bit light on. I do feel like he's in their best side here in New Zealand. But getting, as Roscoe just said, going over to the subcontinent, different kettle of fish. And if he's not taking wickets in conditions that suit him, it's going to leave him susceptible when he gets over there. I couldn't believe Neil Wagner wasn't in the 11. I, I just genuinely thought that he must have been out through a niggle. Because the Staggering. success he's had against Australia, particularly Steve Smith over a period of time, you can guarantee that the last week of partnership wouldn't have happened if Wagner was there because he would have oh, yeah. intimidated Josh Hazelwood at least. He might have stopped Cameron Green from scoring as well. So, um, yeah, I thought that was a really interesting decision. Green's had his trouble to the short ball as well over yeah. the last few years. It's, uh, it's a big miss for New Zealand not having him there. So tell me about that, Ross Taylor. You've got Neil Wagner who goes into retirement. A couple of tests ago against South Africa, cameras caught him giving the finger and shushing to someone. There was a little bit of confusion at the time. Can you clear all this up? Is this now becoming a little bit more clearer that perhaps there's a little bit of unrest in the Kiwi camp? <laughs> Well, I think it all makes sense a little bit now. Um, you know, there's no sugarcoating it. I think it's a false retirement. Um, if you listen to Wagner's press conference, he was retiring, but it was after this last test match. So he did make himself available. Um, yeah, I think any time... It's not only his experience and the way he goes about it, but, you know, the opposition you heard um, Cummings talking about the plans that they had for him. Um, you know, experience plays a lot. Um, but no, nah, I agree with Finchie. Um, you know, if he if he comes around the wicket to Hazelwood, he might have got him away for a couple of boundaries or even a six. But I think for the, for the prolonged time, he would have attacked him for. Uh, I don't think they would have got a hundred run partnership. And um, and to see that he isn't selected, uh, the going was says. You know, I think I I do like and you do need to plan for the future. But a one off test against Australia in a must win situation, uh, I wouldn't be looking much further than uh, Neil Wagner. And I'm sure the Australian batters are, are sleeping easy that he's not on the side. About time there's some more unrest in the key. Yes. Okay. For, for so oh, long, they've, 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 been, they've, they've been poking fun of, at us because there's, there's always a little bit going on behind the scenes yep. in Australian cricket. It's great to see. <laughs> the <laughs> nice guys of cricket, not so nice to each other at the moment, Ross Taylor. Um, before I let you go, I just wanted to ask about the Kane Williamson run out because, Ross, got to point out, you were involved in a few <laughs> and I believe you've had a little bit of feedback from your own family on this Kane Williamson run out. Yeah, I mean, any time your best batters run out, um, it's not a, it's not very good, especially with the form that he's in, but uh, with the history that we had, um, social media, it, you know, I've been retired for a couple of years now and every time Kane has <laughs> run out or, or part of a run out, um, I seem to get tagged in it. Um, <laughs> 
But there was there was one that got brought up recently that you know was was, was Ross Taylor going to be blamed for this one with with Will Young, um, <laughs> and then someone goes, no, obviously he's not he's not going to get blamed for it, but. Um, you know, Kane suffers from PTSD with running with Ross. So, you know, you can't really, you can't really um, win in that situation. But uh, no, nah, obviously there's a bit of history there. But um, you know, for New Zealand to succeed in this next Test match, uh, we need Kane to to get back out there to his uh, hundred scoring ways, and, and hopefully he's not run out and it's not nothing to do with me. I love your work, Ross Taylor, and we have run out of time. Thank you so much for joining us. So you'll be back in a couple of days' time as we preview this second test. Looking forward to that. Thanks for your time. Don't go anywhere on Around the Wicket. We've got the short stuff coming up next. It is time to take on the short stuff. Boys, who did it better? Andrew Simons all those years ago, Johnny Besto at the Ashes last year, or Elisa Healy in the past week in the WPL, Berg? Oh, what a shoulder from Roy. I can't go past him. He's absolutely brilliant. Look at the size of him. Just really pummeled him. But the other two... I mean, Elisa Healy, she's put her hand up there strongly. <laughs> I love the fact that the Indian crowds could not believe that a player <laughs> took on a fan. Uh, did you see a mashup coming between Steve Smith and the Mighty Ducks? Oh, I, no. I certainly <laughs> did. Steve Smith is an absolute nuffy when it comes to the Mighty Ducks. He references it and quotes it all the time. Julie the Cat Gaffney in the in goal there, just yes. <laughs> sticking in the left mitt like he did in the in the test match there in New Zealand. So, brilliant. This is his own Instagram, Fergie. <laughs> he's just a little nerd at heart, isn't he? Oh, I love a bit of self-appreciation, so <laughs> it's it good to see him throw it up there. Bo Webster, he could pull off a thousand run season in the Shield. He's leading run scorer, unbelievable, averaging at the moment, uh, if I can get it here, 70. Should we be talking about him more? Yeah, I think he'll definitely be in the conversation shortly. He's somebody who's who's got a really good all-round package. He's an unbelievable slips fielder. Smacking runs at a really good strike rate as well and, and wickets as well. Neil Wagner as well. A password by a fan at the base. and love that. Did you have yourself? Myself. <laughs> See you next time.